Okay, so, so far we've seen uh, how one measures uh, distances to stars using uh, parallax measurements. Then, once we know the distance of a star, we can determine its overall energy output by measuring how bright it appears to be to us at given distance from it, and then using the relationship between brightness, luminosity, and distance, we can determine uh, the luminosity of the star. Then we discussed how we can measure the surface temperature of the star using the Wien's law or black body radiation law. Note one thing, that in order to determine the surface temperature of the star, you don't need its distance. You don't need to know the distance. All you need to do is do the spectral analysis, uh, resolve the starlight into different components, measure how much energy is carried by each component, and then by finding at what wavelength it emits most of the energy, you can then find out what the surface temperature is. You can do that without knowing its distance from us. It, it doesn't matter. Next, once we know the luminosity of the star, and we know its surface temperature, we can then figure out its radius using yet another law of physics, so-called Stefan Boltzmann's law. What that law says is uh, the following. If I have any emitter of radiation, it doesn't have to be necessarily a star, um, any source of radiation that has radius R and surface temperature T, right? And um, then its luminosity is related to uh, its temperature and the radius as follows. There is another universal constant whose numerical value is of no interest to us, unless you want to do uh, the actual precise calculations. So it's universal constant. It's directly proportional to the surface area of the source. And assuming it's a sphere, the surface area is just 4 pi times the radius squared. And the temperature to the fourth power. Okay, so if I uh, determine luminosity in the ways we discussed and we measure its surface temperature, then we can uh, use this relation to deduce the radius of the star. Now, I want you to note one thing, that the luminosity depends on the radius of the source uh, uh, as radius squared and on the temperature as temperature to the power of 4. So the luminosity is actually much more sensitive to the temperature than it is to the size of the radius. Because, for instance, if I would double the radius of the source, the luminosity would increase by a factor of 4, right? If I go from R equal to 1 to R equal to 2, the luminosity increases from, for the same temperature T, the luminosity increases uh, by 2 squared, that is by a factor of 4. But for a fixed radius, if I double the temperature, then I have increase in luminosity by a factor of 2 to the power of 4, which is 16. 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, times 2 is 16. So the luminosity is much more sensitive to the temperature of the source than it is to the radius. So uh, 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 this here implies uh, that uh, if a star is very luminous, and yet it's cool, has a low temperature. 
it must have enormous radius. And vice versa, if the, a star is dim, but its surface is incredibly hot, the only way I can produce low luminosity with very hot surface is if the radius of the star is small. And those stars are called white dwarfs. White because they are white hot. Their surface temperature is enormous. Uh, but because they have low luminosity, they are dim, as a result of their small radius, they're called dwarfs. Typical white dwarf has a radius comparable to the radius of the Earth. And they are basically residues of uh, medium mass stars like our sun. Once our sun uh, uses all of its nuclear fuel and can't produce energy anymore, its dead core is going to be a white dwarf. On the opposite end, if you have uh, a very luminous star, which is cool, the only way you can achieve that is if the star has huge radius. And those stars are called red giants. Red because of their uh, low surface temperature. They appear to be reddish. Giants because they are extremely luminous because of their huge radius. So they must be a gigantic in size. Hence, they are called giants. Let me give you uh, an example. In fact, uh, our sun has been shining on for about 4.6 billion years. It's roughly halfway through its life, so it will shine on for another 4.6 billion years, and then it will be out of fuel. So in those last stages, it will effectively swell up into a red giant, uh, whose radius is go going to be probably comparable to the uh, 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 radius of the planet Mars. That means that all the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, and Earth, would be swallowed by bloated sun. That would be the ultimate end um, of the Earth, right? But we don't have to worry about it because it's a long way off, uh, 4.6 billion years. It turns out that actually there's something uh, 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 other that is happening, as I'll discuss in, um, um, later on in the course. Uh, it turns out that over time, the luminosity of the sun increases, right? Now it is about 30% more luminous than when it formed. And the estimate is that in about half a billion to a billion years, uh, its energy output is going to be even higher, so much so that the temperature on Earth is going to be high that no water can exist in the liquid form. All the oceans, all the lakes, all the rivers would evaporate, okay? It would make it very difficult for life. So we don't have to worry about the ultimate end in 4.6 billion years. Uh, there are things that are going to happen uh, much sooner, not of course in our lifetime. I said half a billion to a billion years. They are going uh, to make the life on Earth unsustainable. Uh, su red supergiants, basically, they form again uh, at the end uh, of uh, 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 life of very massive stars, much more massive than our sun. Hot, high T, uh, dim, low L, stars must have a uh, low radius. And for that reason, because they are hot and small, uh, uh, they are so-called white dwarfs. These objects, white dwarfs, are not just hypothesized. I mean, astronomers can see them. In fact, the one that was discovered first is so-called uh, Sirius B. Sirius is a star, the brightest star in the 
northern hemisphere that could be seen with the naked eye, uh, but it's actually a binary system. Uh, it's a two-star system where one, Sirius A, is the regular main sequence star, but its companion is actually a white dwarf, and it's called Sirius B. So Sirius B is one example of a white dwarf. So let us look at one example. Let's look at the Betelgeuse in Orion. The name uh, comes from the Arabic name, uh, and uh, it's retained. It's called uh, Betelgeuse. Remember, it's the, the star in the shoulder of the Orion. So we are talking about this star here, uh, the one in the shoulder of the Orion. Its luminosity is 10,000 times the luminosity of the sun. But it has a low temperature, about 3,000 degrees Kelvin, and it looks red. So you can use the Stefan Boltzmann's law and find out, uh, because you know the, its luminosity and you know its surface temperature, and you can find out uh, how large the radius of the Betelgeuse is. And the result is that its radius is about 800 times the radius of the sun. Now, the radius of the sun is about 110, more precisely, 109 times the radius of the Earth. That is 700,000 kilometers. The diameter of the sun is therefore 1.4 million kilometers. Betelgeuse is 800 times bigger than that. It would go beyond the orbit of Jupiter, which is at about 5.2 astronomical units away from the sun. So Betelgeuse is an example of a supergiant. It's very unstable uh, through uh, Hubble Space Telescope. Astronomers have collected a series of shots of its surface, and it can go off into supernova. Very massive stars, like Betelgeuse, uh, eventually explode. Uh, and these are very important moments for life in the universe, because it turns out that all the chemical elements heavier than helium uh, gets formed and dispersed in, in that explosion. Okay, So, for instance, all the oxygen that we breathe and is part of the water molecule in our bodies, or all the carbon that is part of the organic molecules in our body, all these atoms were synthesized when the star exploded. Okay, so we are all made out of star stuff. So that explosion is referred to as type two supernova, and uh, Betelgeuse can go off any time, of course, because if it's a uh, large distance uh, from us, uh, it might take a few hundred years uh, before we become aware of that event. But it's possible that it can actually happen in our lifetime, because it's really close to the end of its life cycle. So the termino terminology that is used is that giants, they have radii that is more than 10 times the sun's radius. Uh, Sun-like are the stars with radii that is um, less than 10 times the sun's radius and greater than one-tenth of the sun's radius. And dwarfs um, are the stars uh, with radii uh, that are less than 0.1 sun's radius. So that is typically terminology that one uses. So, so far we've, we found out how we can determine the distance, the luminosity, the surface temperature, and the radius of the star, right? Only for temperature, you don't, know, you don't need to know the distance to the star. For everything else, implicitly you need to know the distance because uh, without distance you can't determine the luminosity. And if you don't know the luminosity, you can't determine 
uh, the star's radius using the Stefan Boltzmann's law.